Morning, uh, I am Matthew Barkas, a research analyst here at Chardon. Uh, thank you for joining us today for a leadership call with Purple Biotech's management team. During this call, we will not be discussing Chardon research. Uh, any discussions about research should be coordinated uh, between a participant and the respective salesperson. Our compliance team has asked me to read the statement uh, for the investor call. Uh, by participating in this call, our speakers attest that they may uh, that they have made Chardon aware. Uh, that they have made Chardon aware of any potential conflicts and they will not discuss any material non-public or confidential information that they are aware of uh, that may breach their legal regulatory or fiduciary responsibility to any parties. Uh, with that, allow me to introduce our guests. Uh, today, I'm joined by Gil Efron, Chief Executive Officer of Purple Biotech, and Dr. Fabian Zabi, uh, the company's Chief Business Officer. Uh, thanks mm -hmm. for joining us today. Thank you. Thank you and good morning, everyone. Uh, to start things off, uh, Gil, will you please give us a, a high-level overview of Purple Biotech as a company and its history uh, for those that might be new to the story? Yes, sure. Thank you, Matt, and good day to everyone. It's, it's a pleasure to be here on this uh, leadership call, and thanks for uh, this opportunity. Um, the company was established back in 2013 under the name of uh, Kitov. It started in a different therapeutic area and was traded on the Tel Aviv Stock Exchange at the time. In 2015, the company was listed also on NASDAQ. And in 2018, received the FDA approval for its first drug. I'm going one year back to 2017. The company has pivoted to oncology with the acquisition of uh, its first oncology asset, NT219. And in 2019, we acquired our second oncology asset, CM24. In 2020, we changed our name to Purple Biotech. And since then, we are focused on oncology only. And we are developing our two first-in-class clinical stage uh, uh, drugs, which we are going to discuss today. Excellent. Now, uh, Gil, I understand you joined Purple Biotech in 2018. Uh, can you tell me what you're up to before joining Purple, and uh, what do you see in Purple that made you want to get involved with the company? Yeah, so so a few words about uh, my background. I uh, I did my career in uh, finance. And I specialized with company uh, uh, traded on Nasdaq. I did my first IPO on Nasdaq in 2006 with a communication company. And then did another IPO with a pharmaceutical company called Kamada in 2011. And since then, that was my entrance into the uh, pharmaceutical uh, uh, space. And I joined Purple in 2018, as you said, as a CFO and deputy um, uh, CEO. In 2021, I was promoted to president and CFO. And then in July of this year, I was appointed as a uh, CEO. Uh, and to your question of uh, uh, what I found in Purple, was a group of uh, talented people with a good mix of uh, uh, what I believe is essential for the successful biotech company, which is the scientific knowledge and the business and, uh, approach. And, and I think this is also a differentiation factor uh, also today for, uh, for Purple. Uh, on top of that, the company uh, already got one drug approved by the FDA, which was for me also a validation for the company capabilities. And then uh, I'm I feel that I have not made a, a mistake since. Great. <laughs> uh, now, Fabian, uh, you had joined Purple Biotech last December, uh, so now fast mm -hmm. approaching your one-year mark with the company. Uh, prior to joining Purple, you were the Executive Director of Business Development at W Farm International, and also held multiple business development roles before then. Uh, can you share with us a little bit about your experience and how that ties into your role with Purple? Of course. Well, I mean, good morning, everyone. Thank you for having us. Um, so, yeah, I mean, a few words on myself. So I'm a scientist by training. Um, uh, I've been in business development for the last 15 years now. And as you just mentioned, the last 10 of which um, with uh, the Biofarm, which is a, a privately held um, family-owned company based in Switzerland, fully focused on drug development and oncology. And in the, in the last four years, when I was heading business development there, we've been very active on the, on the deal-making side. So to reshape the, the pipeline, so uh, four in licensing, two out licensing deal, including the Zivina Pound transaction with um, Serono, a product that is now in phase three, in locally advanced head and neck cancer, which is uh, close to us today. Um, um, so so th this was, a, this was a, a great tenure for me, and it was the time for, to look for a new challenge in a, in a different environment, and that's how the, 
geopolitics came uh, at, at Purple. Um, so publicly traded, young and dynamic company that completely reinvented uh, itself, as Kim mentioned, uh, positioned in innovative drug development in oncology. This is what, uh, what I liked. So I met with a, you know, ambitious and committed and passionate team uh, willing to expand out of Israel. So, so this was also a criteria as well. So I joined in, in December last year, and um, and really the objective is to strengthen the pipeline by leveraging the value that we create in our uh, clinical development efforts. We're also looking for uh, new opportunities to to, to expand. Um, the portfolio. Wonderful. All right. Uh, now, before we get any further, uh, for the record, why is the company's name Purple Biotech? Mind you, the logo for the company is an aquamarine colored circle of sorts. Yeah, so I, I can give many reasons, but then um, I would like to leave it for each one of you to interpret it as, as you want. I can say that for me, colors are about life and, and positive future. So this is what I would like and, and to do for the community and, the, and patients. And this is my interpretation, but everyone can take an, uh, their own interpretation. And, and for the, the color of our logo, uh, um, it's a very good way to get attention. Uh, which is important in our world. So this is as simple as that. Very fun. Yeah, thanks. Okay. Um, now, will you please uh, take us through the key catalysts anticipated in the near term and over the next 12 to 18 months uh, before we get to uh, your programs in more detail? Yeah, so so I'll start with uh, NT219. Um, and, and we plan to have the recommended phase two dose uh, for the monotherapy arm in early 2023. And the recommended phase two dose for the combination um, uh, in the second quarter of 2023. For CN24, uh, um, we are planning an interim report uh, from the phase two study that uh, we are running now in the second half of 2023, and the top line uh, uh, data in the second half of, uh, of 2024 uh, from this study. So these are like the main uh, data catalysts uh, from our programs. And of course, we'll have an uh, interim uh, data and then uh, uh, more data probably published in the different medical conferences during 2023 and 2024. Excellent. All right, um, I guess, yeah, let's go ahead and start with uh, your CM24 program. Um, it's a humanized anti-CCAM1 monoclonal antibody initially developed out of Sheba Medical Center. Uh, can you elaborate on the significance of targeting CCAM1 and its role in germogenesis? Sure. I mean, I mean, I can say that. So, so I mean, CCAM1 is a is, is a very um, interesting target in a, in a way that, that uh, it's overexpressed in um, in a series of uh, specific uh, um, tumor cells and tumor types, uh, among which uh, pancreatic cancer, bladder cancer, CLC, and SCLC, to name a few. Uh, but also expressed on infiltrating uh, immune cells, uh, leukocytes, so T cells, in cases, but also some myeloid cells. So, um, so it has a, a very, uh, very distinct uh, expression profile. And, it, and its first role, as it, as it was described, was um, to basically um, inhibit the, the immune response uh, against uh, the, the tumor and then promote basically the, the tumor growth. So uh, through interaction with it's ligands, so I mean, uh, in CCAM1 can interact with CCAM5, CCAM1 has also uh, interaction with TIM3. So, um, so we've shown that uh, CM24 is able to restore the immune uh, response against uh, tumors, um, so reactivating the T cells and NK cells, so acting as, as an immune checkpoint in a very uh, similar manner as, uh, as uh, on TAPD1, for instance. But what's interesting is that there's more to it. I mean, uh, this is a target where there is uh, a, lo a lot of new findings. And, and more recently, there's been some reports linking CCAM1 uh, uh, with some very interesting structures called uh, neutrophil extracellular like traps, for instance, so I mean, produced by neutrophils. And, uh, and those structures are directly associated to the development of uh, metastasis. And, uh, and we think that you know, by blocking the addition of, uh, of cancer cells to, uh, to those structures, I mean, CM24 has also the ability um, to prevent the emergence of new, of new metastases. And, and, and we think that this is why this is a, a multifunctional, let's say, uh, uh, product. And we believe that uh, this contributes also to the, the efficacy that we see in patients. So, so I mean, we are, we are very proud to be, uh, to be leading the field. So we are the, the most advanced anti seeking one. And, uh, and it's uh, yeah, a great target to me. Great. Uh, and 
So uh, what are the prior uh, studies that have been performed with CM24 and where are you at in terms of uh, development stage and uh, the data package that you've developed to date for the program? Sure, well, I, I would say, I mean, so far the development is pretty uh, pretty seamless and straightforward. So, I um, mean, obviously started with a with a phase one as a monotherapy I mean, to uh, mainly to establish the safety. So this was uh, this was done beautifully. I mean, uh, very manageable safety profiles, no DLTs up to uh, the 10 milligrams per kilos in monotherapy, and uh, and we could observe uh, uh, eight standard uh, stable disease in this in this first part. But I would say, I mean, the most significant uh, study is the is the study that we completed this year. Uh, some one of the milestones that we achieved uh, in 2022. Um, so this is the phase, phase one B in combination with uh, with nivolumab. And um, so, I mean, obviously here again, I mean, prime objective is to establish the safety, and we could show a very uh, uh, well tolerated combination um, across the three dose levels that we uh, we tested. So uh, 10, 15, and 20 milligrams per kilo. Um, but we also, and importantly so, uh, reported some uh, early signs of efficacy, which is uh, obviously very encouraging. And uh, so we had one confirmed partial response um, in, a, in a third line pancreatic cancer patient. So we, we all know how um, difficult those patients are. And, uh, and three additional stable disease, and two of which in, in PDAC again. So, um, so out of 11 very difficult to treat uh, patients, so for us, that was a uh, the good ground to um, to to launch the phase two and to uh, to investigate the combination now um, in second line in combination with chemotherapy. Understood. And uh, what would you say is the rationale behind selecting pancreatic cancer as the initial target indication for CM24? Well, I mean that that's a good point. I mean, we, I mean, obviously there are there are a number of possibilities ahead of us based on the on, on the target, and the target expression is one of the first criteria that obviously we we, we follow here. So um, um, we we have um, plenty of uh, uh, documentation to show how high the level of uh, um, CKM1 is in pancreatic cancer patients and in the tissue and in the in the infiltrate. But that's not the only uh, criteria that is important in our, in our selection. So, I mean, uh, obviously, the unmet medical need is is um, of, of premium importance. I mean, we all know, I mean, how difficult that uh, PDAC is. I mean, to date, I mean, that's only chemotherapy that is available to these patients, and um, so there is an, a, a high need for, for for new treatment options. So that's uh, uh, indisputable, I think. It's it's a large market, uh, um, so we have an, a, a large number of patients uh, already in second line. I mean, we have around sixty thousand patients uh, eligible, and and uh, unfortunately, I would say, I mean, the time to endpoints. I mean, uh, if we look at PFS and OS in in, in these patients, uh, this is very short. So this gives also, I mean, shorter time to outcome and to to measure the the benefit of the of the drug. So that's a little bit the, the, the criteria that are important for us in terms of selecting the, the indication. Okay. And uh, can you walk us through the design of your ongoing study? Yeah, so I'll take it. So we are running a phase two clinical trial evaluating the use of CN24 in combination with a PD-1 inhibitor, nivolumab, plus chemotherapy for patient with second line metastatic pancreatic cancer. The clinical trial design has been recently amended to randomize the patients, and comparing CM24 plus nivolumab plus standard of care chemotherapy against standard of, chemo standard of care chemotherapy alone. The study is ongoing, and patients are already being treated in a running portion of the study, which include up to 18 patients, to be followed then by approximately 60 patients in the randomized part of the, of the study. And as Fabian mentioned, the primary endpoint in the study is uh, OS, and secondary would be a, a PFS and different measurements of PFS, uh, overall response rate, et cetera. Okay, got it. And uh, in terms of your decision to um, evaluate CM24 in combo with uh, nivolumab, can you give us uh, the rationale for that combination? And also considering that you know, there's multiple PD-1 antibodies out there, like what makes uh, partnering with PMS here attractive? Sure. Well, I mean, I mean, globally speaking, back to the mechanism of action, so as I mentioned, I mean, there is a, a strong immunology com uh, component to, um, to, uh, to CM24. And, uh, and in that sense, I mean, here we are 
uh, exploring IO IO combinations. So this is uh, this is something uh, that is uh, that is very relevant. And the point is trying to uh, also uh, to explore this combination in a patient population where um, the anti PD one alone, I mean, what was, was not successful. So so I mean. Uh, uh, to date in PDAC as outside of the MS environment, there, there was no benefit. So, so this is the this is the first rationale. The second is, I mean, reasons to believe. I mean, given the, the different uh, uh, mode of action that I just described about CM24, I mean, we think that there's a good ground to um, to believe that this combination could deliver a meaningful benefit to patients. And if we go more, let's say, into the details on one way in the volume map, I mean, I mean, well, first of all, I mean, it's a very well, I mean, very well established and very successful product. Um, so the, the PK profile is uh, fully compatible with uh, with CMT24. So this is another important aspect, and and eventually also uh, we found an agreement with VMS. I mean, for, for them to supply the drug and, and help it to conduct the study. So this was uh, basically I mean, the the rationale for for having this particular combination in this particular. Um, patient settings. Got it. Uh, and uh, I guess, yeah, so it looks like uh, we have anticipated in interim data in the first half of 2023 from the program. Uh, what expectations has Purple set forth uh, for you know, this uh, interim data set? Yeah, so so when, when we spoke about the endpoints, so I've mentioned overall survival as the primary endpoint, and, and I think this is key in, in second line because then uh, PFS is very short in second line, and then there might be variability uh, uh, that is impacted by the timing of the, of the scan. So uh, uh, this is uh, uh, what we're looking at. Um, the, the overall survival looked promising in the phase one uh, uh, when we uh, were treating a, a patient mostly in third line. Uh, uh, so. Uh, and so this was an, an, a very encouraging. And then um, we will be, of course, also looking in, at other measurements such as PFS rates and, and all of ours. So, so we'll have all the data in front of us and then uh, we can report in, in, in that data on due time. And we're also going to have a control arm uh, for the two standard of care regimens, and, uh, which is going to be very helpful in providing the answer on the robustness of the of the result, so so this was the reason why we amended the the clinical study uh, to be randomized, and that should help us in in getting the, the right data out of the study. Got it. Um, and so now that uh, I guess yeah, just talking more generally uh, about the IO space, um, it's rather populated. How do you see competing programs in the CCAM one pathway? such as those targeting TIM3 and their combinations impacting Purple's general strategy? And ultimately, how do you see CM24 fitting in the treatment landscape for patients? Yeah, so uh, um, so, so first regarding uh, uh, TIM3, so, so our understanding of the TIM3 mechanism suggests that the TIM3 may be regulated by CCAM1. So uh, uh, maybe in, in simple words, you know, uh, 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 inhibiting a uh, uh, CCAM1 could be an, an, a better uh, a potential outcome. Uh, um, and we, are, we have also looked into potentially combining uh, our antibody with an anti-TIM3, and this is still uh, is something that we, we will be reviewing. And uh, um, all the other CCAM1 uh, programs that we are aware of are, are earlier stage than ours, so we are uh, way ahead of this uh, program, and especially none of them that I'm aware of is in uh, in clinical and uh, stage like us. And then, uh, in general, uh, you know, there are different potential uh, combination, and we may be looking for other combinations in the future. Uh, we decided to start with uh, with a combination with nivolumab, as Fabian has mentioned having a certain rationale for uh, uh, for that and uh, we'll see what the outcome is from the, the current studies before okay and uh you touched a little bit on the uh population of uh, pancreatic cancer patients um can you maybe elaborate as to uh, how many of these patients you find that might be addressable with cm24 um Yes, yeah, so, so what we saw is that um, uh, there is a high expression and uh, level of, uh, of CCAM1 on, on most of the uh, uh, pancreatic cancer uh, patients or, or 
uh, uh, tumor microarrays that we have uh, evaluated. Um, and then, um, so if we take the, the, the 60,000 patients in the US only, for example, in first line, and most of them probably progress to, to second line. So that's, that would be our addressable and, and market. And still, we are in, in the process of identifying potential biomarkers. And as we go through the development plan, that could help us have that treatment more and targeted. And we'll know that better when we continue the development program. OK, and uh, what are your thoughts um, about moving beyond pancreatic cancer with CM24 and you know what next indications we might see there? Yes, so so we do have plans and uh, uh, for additional uh, uh, studies or additional indications, and but this is pending on on collecting additional uh, data, and uh, in on top of that also having the sufficient resources to run these uh, additional programs. So so we have identified uh, 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 at least one indi one indication, and then uh, we are considering that pending and uh, uh, further evaluation of it. Okay. Um, and, and I think with that, uh, why don't we move on to your uh, other lead program, NT219, a uh, small molecule dual inhibitor of both the insulin receptor substrate one and two and STAT3 pathways. Uh, what's the significance of the dual inhibitor approach here and what indications is NT219 most suitable for? Right. So, yeah, as you say, I mean, NT219 is a, is a dual inhibitor. So, so I mean, um, uh, targeting two very uh, significant signaling pathways. So, I mean, STAT3, which is probably familiar for um, for a lot of us, I mean, in the, in the industry, I mean, IRS a bit less because it's a much more um, specific scaffold protein uh, that is upstream of, uh, of, of AKT. So, um, uh, also very significant in the, in the tumor, gen tumor genesis. Um, and what's interesting about these two pathways together is, they are, is that they are uh, known to be activated um, in response to some of the, let's say, the most established cancer treatments, such as EGFR inhibitors, and we'll be talking more about this, but not only, I mean, uh, uh, pretty much all the uh, drugs targeted the MAP kinase pathways, uh, BRAF, MEK inhibitors, more recently KRAS inhibitors, all those, I mean, are, are in the same, uh, uh, in the same uh, pathway and uh, facing the same bypass mechanism. So, so the activation then uh, prevents those drugs, I mean, to, uh, to, to work long term and, and, and lead to relapse of the patient. So, um, so the significance, I would say, to, to, of the NT219 uh, of putting those two um, pathways together has been very nicely demonstrated. And I think this is uh, data that we've shared already and, and uh, in, in, a, in a model of adenic cancer when we couldn't compare NT219, dual inhibitor, these two pathways to single inhibitors of each. And we could very uh, clearly demonstrate that the only way to restore a response to a G4 inhibitor, namely that was allotinib in this, um, in this study, was to block both uh, escape mechanisms. So either with NT219, one drug, or with um, putting like one inhibitor of the, of the jack stat and one inhibitor of the PI3K. So, I mean, this illustrates why this dual inhibition is very relevant. And, and also, I mean, um, why single inhibitors, I mean, are, are not relevant that much of a, of a success. Got it. Uh, now, the NT219 program uh, initiated out of Hebrew University. Uh, how did Purple come under control of the development of the program? So I mentioned before that the company acquired the asset back in 2017. At the time, this was still in a, in a pre-IND stage. And we took it and all the way to IND and then to the clinic. And it's a, it's a good example of purple capability to identify assets that were overlooked by, I would say, large pharma companies. And then I think the preliminary data that we presented so far uh, uh, supports that uh, uh, capability. Okay. Um, and where are you at in terms of stage of development with the NT219? Yes, yeah, so, so we, we are running now in, in the phase one uh, part of the study in a dose escalation, the standard dose escalation. We're doing it in two arms. Uh, first arm is a monotherapy. 
And then uh, we are now at the 50 milligram per kg and, uh, dose level, which is the last uh, planned dose level in the monotherapy arm. In parallel to that, um, um, we started also an, a combination arm in combination with uh, cetuximab. And then um, we uh, are now at the third dose level. So we started at six milligram, 12, and now 24 milligram. And then uh, next, uh, it would be the, the 50 milligram uh, per kg as soon as we complete the, uh, the current dose level. And then um, th this is an, uh, uh, um, our plan. And then what we're planning to do is to take it into a uh, uh, recurrent and metastatic head and head cancer in a phase two study. So this is the, the current uh, uh, plan that we have for the development of anti Okay, and why is head and neck cancer uh, an appropriate first indication to explore uh, with NT219? Yes, well, I'm sorry, Fabien, please take it. Of course. Um, so, I mean, head and neck cancer is, is, is relevant. I mean, again, I mean, diff different, uh, different aspects there. So as I, as I just mentioned, so, I mean, uh, when, when we want to explore a uh, combination with EGA4 inhibitors, so cetuximab um, is, uh, is registered there. Um, it's been recently uh, say displaced to second line uh, further to the, uh, the approval of, um, of uh, immune checkpoint inhibitors as, as first line. So, I mean, we have uh, uh, a very strong rationale to combine. Um, we have here again, the same uh, uh, criteria. Um, the the helmet need is very high. I mean, today this, this uh, treatment, I mean, the response rate is barely 15%. Um, so, I mean, really, the, the, there is a, a hope for, for, for those patients to, to get better treatment. And this is also a large population. I mean, uh, head and neck cancer altogether is the, is the sick um, uh, cancer type in the world. And it's, I would say particularly burdensome um, disease. I mean, given the type of tumor uh, we're looking at, and um, so and, and and same thing. I mean, we're always trying to reason in what is the short path to market. And again, in this indication, I mean, given the the endpoint, I mean, this would be a very attractive entry point from our point of view. Now, this is by by no means the only uh, positioning that we could consider. But I mean, in, in terms of prioritization, I mean, that, that that makes a lot of sense. Again, how many uh, patients do you believe can be addressed with uh, NT219? Well, from, from our assessment, I mean, uh, now if we, if we focus on that said, uh, six, six uh, uh, cancer type in the world, so that's a lot of patients altogether. Now, if we really look uh, um, into the treatment tree, uh, so recurrent metastatic uh, first, and, uh, and second line, I mean, assessment is around uh, 37,000 uh, patients in the, in, the, in, the, in the addressable market. Okay, and um, yeah, maybe you can uh, review a little bit on the trial design and the uh, expected next data sets. Yeah, so uh, um, the last time we uh, released data was in, um, at ASCO uh, uh, this year. And the, the data we have been, uh, released was from the first and um, three dose level in the monotherapy uh, arm. There were 11 patient evaluable. And it's, the drug was uh, well tolerated. And then um, we also showed one partial response uh, out of these 11 uh, patients and three uh, uh, stable diseases. Uh, um, just to mention that uh, the one uh, partial response and the three stable disease were all mutated KRAS and, uh, patients, which is also something that uh, could be a direction for, uh, for the drug. Um, we, uh, uh, we just released an update for the timing of, of the next uh, 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 data that will be published. So uh, um, we'll have the recommended phase two dose in the first quarter of 2023 from the uh, monotherapy arm. And then uh, in the second quarter of 2023, we'll have the recommended phase two dose for the combination arm. And as I mentioned, this announcement will be followed probably by publication of data at the uh, medical uh, conferences and next year. Okay, great. And um, I guess, yeah, in, in addition to identifying the recommended phase two dose levels, um, how are you mapping out expectations in terms of, um, will, will you be showing efficacy data here as well? 
Yes, so, you know, the, the next ten, uh, uh, part of the study that Fabian has mentioned in the, in the uh, head and neck cancer would be a phase two study. And then, uh, of course, we are going to uh, measure also uh, uh, efficacy in, uh, there. And then um, there, there are other opportunities with NT219 in different uh, uh, indications. Um, we also have it on our presentation. We, we also identified additional indication. I, I mentioned one opportunity before, like with the mutated KRAS uh, uh, patient, which is something uh, uh, that takes a lot of uh, attention today. And then uh, we're also evaluating it. All right, and uh, a question from our audience uh, is asking what type of KRAS mutations is NT219 looking to treat? Yeah. Well, I can take that. So, I mean, that's a, that's a very good question. So, obviously, now the recent breakthrough, we, we were very much focused on the G12C and an SCLC. I mean, but uh, clearly, what the, the beauty of NT219, I mean, NT219 is not a direct inhibitor of KRAS. So, basically, I mean, the, the, the benefit it would provide would be um, a, a mutation agnostic. So, it's ex expected uh, across the board of mutations. So, that's, uh, that's also, we, we think, a, a strength of this, uh, of this uh, positioning. Great. Um, and yeah, maybe we'll we'll move on now to talk more generally about uh, your platform and, and corporate strategy. Uh, how are you thinking about ex the expansion of Purple's pipeline in the future? Well, I mean, this is a this is an important point. So this is clearly part of our of our uh, corporate strategy. So um, um, so we are we are uh, very actively looking at the opportunities outside. Being mindful of our resources, obviously, I mean, uh, on the size of the of the team and the, and, and and the finances, but I mean, this is and uh, this is something that is that is important to us. Um, well, in the current market situation, I would say, I mean, uh, we, we believe that there are opportunities. I mean, to find um, you know um, nice, innovative. I mean, we want to to remain uh, faithful to you, like truly innovative. So, first in class that we have, or very well differentiated, best in class. So, this is what we look at. And um, and the intent here is to is to um, leverage our um, clinical development capabilities um, on programs that would be ideally uh, slightly earlier than than the, the two that we just talked about. So, so I would say late for clinical would be a, a good fit for us. Great. And uh, in terms of like cash runway and and uh, supporting your programs, like how are you uh, navigating the current markets and you know where are you at right now? Um, in terms of a cash position. Yeah, so so we just res reported our uh, Q3 financial. So at the end of uh, Q3, we had $35.7 million. And then uh, this is enough cash uh, uh, to take us uh, until the end of uh, 2024 with the current program. And then and we have many data events until that point. Uh, um, so, uh, uh, and of course, the more money we have, the more we can do. So we're looking forward to having an, a, a data and, and good data and leveraging on it. And, and we have additional uh, uh, opportunities, such as additional indications that uh, uh, we mentioned for the existing program. Uh, um, and, but we will wait uh, 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 before we uh, uh, launch this program, not to risk the company financial stability. Okay. And uh, what is your like strategic approach to partnering versus internal development for your programs? And how are you factoring timing uh, as well with this, with your partnering strategy? Yeah, so, so I believe that in oncology, there is an, an, a significant advantage for large pharma in, in launching drugs. Uh, um, so, so I would say this is an, uh, probably the ultimate goal, but um, and the timing really re depends on the opportunity. And then, um, you know, as long as the data is good and justified, we will continue to develop the, the assets and, and look for, an, uh, for partnerships. So, so we do seek collaboration. And then, uh, um, and since for both programs, there are uh, synergies in combining with an, a, a, a other drugs, so that could be also a direction we can take with a, a, a part of this combination. We did partner on C24 with a, a, a BMS on a clinical collaboration, and then um, we're, we're open for a, a partnerships. All right, great. And in terms of uh, manufacturing and uh, uh, 
uh, for your programs? Um, how are you, you know, positioned for that in, in terms of supporting your trials and uh, you know, potential eventual commercialization? Yeah, so, so it's, too, it's too early to speak about um, uh, commercialization because we're still in a, a phase one, two um, uh, stage. Um, but we do have uh, secured our supply chain. Uh, we have our third party manufacturer and then uh, uh, this, uh, this is well established. Got it. And, uh, and then I'm getting questions about uh, in terms of your partnership strategy. Are you looking to um, partner or go alone until uh, phase three um, for some of your programs? Like, are you positioned to, uh, you know, take this all the way to the finish line? So, so I, I, I said that and also when, uh, when you asked me about our uh, partnership, partnership strategy, it really depends on the opportunity. And then, uh, um, so if there is a good opportunity um, we can uh, uh, out license it, it earlier. And if there is an, a good data, we will continue to, to develop it uh, uh, even through phase three. It's a, it's a really question of, uh, of uh, how things develop. And then, and then um, as I said, for us, partnership is um, uh, something that I see uh, positively. We can take advantage from capabilities of others, from the validation of these partners. So uh, 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 this is certainly um, a path forward. Okay, um, and uh, I'm getting a few questions uh, about um, what your current perspective is on uh, Purple's stock price and how you see that uh, appreciating uh, going forward. Yeah, so, um, you know, I would say that I cannot argue with the, with the market. So uh, this is how shareholder value then uh, the company and we have to work with it. And I believe our job is to get good data, and then uh, and then the market will uh, will adjust itself to the, um, uh, the appreciate the, the company and uh, value, and then um, so so investors are smart, and, and it is our job to deliver and, and to allow them to then uh, uh, make their assessment. And, and you know, I would say that uh, in in that context, I think we have great assets, uh, uh, first in class. And we have a great, capable, and, and, and a talented team, and, and a great board, and, and we have the resources to uh, uh, to deliver. So uh, uh, this is what where we are focused right now. Cool. I'm I'm seeing a few uh, compliments about your your uh, stylish glasses, Fabian, and uh, but maybe to uh, close things out. <laughs> Uh, to close things out, um, from your perspective, uh, what, if anything, do you think the market is currently missing about Purple Biotech? Um, so, when, um, um, you know, I, I cannot speak for the, for the market. And then, um, you know, we, we're very focused on advancing uh, our program and then, um, and then, and then uh, getting clinical data and hopefully uh, uh, having that appreciated by the market and then, and, and, you know, and, and also being uh, reflected in the, in the company and uh, uh, value. And then this is, an, this is an, uh, what we are focused on. Excellent. Um, well, yeah, I think with, with that, that concludes our uh, conversation today. And I really appreciate you uh, taking the time uh, to participate in our leadership call with Purple Biotech. Um, hopefully this was uh, insightful. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you, Matt. And thank you, Chad, and for uh, giving us this opportunity. Thank Absolutely. you very much.